Aaron David Miller is a former U.S. Middle East negotiator who worked for Republican and Democratic secretaries of state and who knew Shimon Peres personally. He is joining us on the telephone. Uh, Aaron, uh, a towering figure, in not just in Israeli politics, but in world politics. Uh, no doubt. And given the leadership vacuum throughout the Middle East uh, and in Israel uh, as well, uh, Shimon Peres's passing uh, is going to be marked, I think, by, by a huge vacuum. He, together with uh, Ariel Sharon, uh, were the last two members of the founding generation. Um, and uh, Israeli political leadership has now passed to a younger generation who seem to lack the confidence, the authority, and the authenticity of Peres Rabin, Menachem Begin, and, and, of course, Israel's greatest prime minister, uh, David Ben-Gurion. I interviewed Perez on the occasion of his 90th birthday, and I asked him what it takes to be a good leader, and he said, if you want to be a leader, you have to serve, because what you can achieve by goodwill, you cannot achieve by power. And if you look at Perez's career, it's remarkable. It's intertwined, literally, with the story of the modern state of Israel, almost from its inception. He was a member of the Knesset for 48 years, longer than any other serving Knesset member. He served 12 cabinets, including finance, defense, foreign minister. And, of course, in 2007, he was elected as Israel's ninth, ninth president. Never got to be prime minister, at least uh, um, by his own personal mandate. Uh, he served in a rotation, and then he inherited Rabin's post temporarily after the assassination. But still, his legacy, I think, in, in peacemaking and as well as in building uh, Israel's defense and security establishment is really quite remarkable. Yeah, uh, Aaron, talk to us a little bit about that Nobel Peace Prize that he shared with Yasser Arafat, who, is the, who was the leader of the Palestinian Liberation Organization, uh, for the Oslo Accords that were signed back in 1993. How important was that? I think to Paris personally, certainly, it was re remarkable. Uh, Menachem Begin had been responsible for peace with Egypt, and, of course, Yitzhak Rabin would be responsible for peace with Jordan. I think Paris saw his role. Well, Rabin preferred the Syrian track. Rabin, uh, Paris saw his role as making making peace with the Palestinians and in secret negotiations. He, he uh, with Rabin's blessing, of course, and input, uh, ended up concluding a remarkable set of arrangements, which later known as the Oslo Peace Process. Structurally flawed, it, it was still nonetheless a heroic effort to reconcile uh, Palestinian national aspirations with Israeli with with Israeli aspirations as well. I remember talking to Paris shortly after the signing ceremony on the White House lawn, and I remember you know how enthusiastic he was and how convinced he was that this would represent a turning point. Sadly, for Paris, his legacy lies now pretty much broken, uh, broken and bloodied. And I think uh, if he had one objective. In his career, I think it would have been to leave um, to leave a legacy of a better relationship uh, with the Palestinians. Uh, Aaron, talk to us. You, you just mentioned a little bit of that, but talk to us what it was like for Mr. Perez at the beginning, at the founding of uh, the nation of Israel back in 1948. As you pointed out, he worked with David Ben Gurion, Israel's first prime minister, even before the creation of the state. Uh, he was a member of the pre-independence military organization, the Haganah. Um, what did he say to you in those times that you've spoken to him about what the times were like back then? You know, I never talked to Perez about the early days. Uh, I can only attest to a meeting I, I or breakfast I attended at Sharon's farm in 2002 when former Special Envoy Anthony Zinni and I were charged with trying to negotiate a ceasefire between Sharon and Arafat. And I remember watching and listening to Ariel Sharon and Perez talk about the old days. And what was so remarkable, here you have two men of different temperament and certainly of different political persuasions, kind of united in the reality that the two of them had witnessed and seen just about everything. They were not members, essentially. Uh, Perez was young at the time. Uh, so you, you wouldn't call him a founder, but he clearly was a member of that of that founding generation. And, and remember, those were the days when when um, Israelis were given tremendous responsibilities at a very young age in the early years of independence. I mean, at 24, Paris was already intimately involved in shaping the Israeli Navy. By 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 the age of 29, he was already director general of the Israeli uh, Defense Ministry and responsible for not only. Uh, uh, deepening Israel's military capacity, but he would be responsible ultimately for the, the, the secret program that led to the development of uh, Israel's um, nuclear weapons industry. So 
Perez really was there. Uh, I told him my interview with him in Foreign Policy dot com uh, present through the creation, not at the creation. Sure, uh, Shimon Peres was there to watch it all, and it, it, it's a remarkable testament. One of the few, I think, political leaders in a democratic polity. I would compare him, perhaps not an accomplishment to Hamilton or Franklin, mm. who never really achieved the highest office uh, of uh, of his country, but played a seminal role in just about every other capacity. And, and the quote Perez gave me in, 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 when he when I interview, interviewed him at 90, if you want to be a leader, serve, because what you can achieve by goodwill you cannot achieve by power. Perez, Perez really was denied what I think he wanted most, uh, other than to leave a legacy of peacemaking. He was denied the opportunity to be elected by the people of Israel in his own right uh, as prime minister, and I think that hurt him. I think, to, to a large extent, you know, Perez had imperfections and failings. He was mocked by Israeli politicians and pundits for his narcissism, for his political slipperiness. A lot of that image softened, though, when he became president of the state uh, in 2007. His prudence, his wisdom, his capacity to represent Israel abroad at a time of great uncertainty, uncertainty I, I, I think, um, in some respects, charmed a nation. And whether he, he became the grandfather of that nation is, is highly arguable. But I think he's going to be mourned and missed, because if at any time in the history of his country that country needed his wisdom and prudence, they need it now. And I wonder, though, as well, Aaron, uh, give us a sense of what it was like uh, after the assassination of Ishtak Rabin back in 1995, and he then took on the mantle of prime minister uh, for a nation uh, that was severely uh, was in mourning. You know, you, you could look for comparisons in American politics. You, you can look at the Rabin assassination, perhaps. I mean, Israel had never had a, a, an assassinated leader before before Rabin, at least a prime minister. We, we had lost several American presidents before Jack Kennedy was killed. But, um, you know, he, he did in some respects try to play Johnson to, not consciously, but perhaps reflected Johnson's efforts to, to continue, let us continue, Johnson said, to try to implement the legacy of, of the martyred president. Johnson did an extraordinary job, and, and Paris did too. And in a way, you know, he and Rabin were, were desperate rivals for so many years. And I think on, uh, certainly on that final night, uh, they, they, had, they had come together in the interests of uh, political harmony and, and peacemaking. And I think Paris, perhaps to a fault, rather than call for early elections, which he probably would have won in the, in the wake of a, of a martyred prime, a prime minister with the momentum and the sympathies of the country on his side, he, he deferred his political instincts and waited. And that delay probably cost him, because ultimately, as you know, he would lose the election to the current prime minister, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu. So the one instance when Paris is, Paris is uh, more ennobling instincts triumphed over his political ones, I, I think cost, um, cost him dearly. And, and uh, who knows? Uh, the, future, the future of the state of Israel might have taken a different turn uh, had Perez uh, declared himself a candidate in the early months of 1996 instead of waiting. Aaron David Miller, thank you so much for your beautiful eulogy and your insights, your valuable insights into this towering figure. We appreciate it. Pleasure. Thanks so much.